Okay, welcome to the first episode of Lube Oil and Filter. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to call it. Uh, this is a quick disassembly and lubrication video for the Atlas GP7s. This one in particular is a standard Atlas GP7. When we get in the chassis, I'll show you basically what the difference is with this and some of the newer versions. It's a real beautiful paint scheme. This is a great northern GP7. No dynamic brake blister on top, no torpedo tubes. All right, and the Great Northern placards on the side. It's an extra thing that Atlas did. Very cool. Um, that's prototypical. Let me get my light really dialed in there. I want you guys to be able to see this really well. So, take her out of the box. Her little foam side packs here. Just to keep the railing straight, you can discard those for now. Don't discard them. You know what I mean. And what we have here is we want to remove the uh, chassis. So let me get a box here. I've got a box from a little steam locomotive I've been working on. Take your locomotive, all right? See this right here? The edge? Hang that puppy right there because you want to get out between these two points, all right? This is not the ideal box. The rear coupler is kind of touching, making contact with the steps. It puts a little pressure on the rear coupler, but this should be a pretty quick action. What you do is you just hold it, tap it, boom, chassis falls right out. The difference between this and some later models, it'll be a little tighter on the DCC models. They tend to have a little bit wider frame up top. No big deal. Now, you've got your bare locomotive here, okay? This is non-DCC. You can tell because it's got singular DC boards. What these are are power pickup here. They pinch in the frame. You can take them out like this and see where the pads connect, all right? All they do is provide lighting. That is it. Very singular purpose here. No problem. Uh, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna mark them, all right? This can be used as a scribe. You can use a small exacto, but I'm just gonna go, one of these gets the R, all right? So I just mark a tiny R on that board so I know which one is for the rear. All right, and then front, and you can take those right out. On an Atlas GP7, you'll notice you have two frame halves, all right? One side looks kind of bland and you got these hex plastic Delrin nuts here. The other side's the exciting side, all right? This is where you've got the pressure contact springs here for the little uh, carriers for the, for the drive line. And then uh, you've got your Phillips head screws there. Those Phillips heads are what secure these frame halves together here and here. This fuel tank can be removed. Be careful, there's a small plastic detail on these fuel tanks that if you pull on it, it'll break off. So grasp it from the main part of the fuel tank and the frame and just pry one side away and then the other. Kind of work it off a little bit. They are pressure fit, but if you buy a used engine, a lot of people, I've seen them glue those things on it's no fun. Now, what we're looking at here is the electrical pickup scheme. Let me see if I can get a little bit better light here. Just a little better light, all right? So I want you guys to get the full shot. This is the power pickup strip, this brass copper contact strip here. The power comes up from these little nubs at the front of the truck, all right? And presses against this little strip here, which is flexible, you see that? So that rides on the top of the truck, which gives the trucks almost a sprung action, okay? They don't rest um, on these contact strips on the way to the locomotive. That is reliant on the top of the ta truck towers here, which we're gonna take it apart and I'll show you. So these contact strips, on some locomotives, they are not equilateral, so you have to make sure that you get the side right, okay? Sometimes they wanna pop right out, sometimes they don't. You can use a little pair of tweezers and gently work them out like that. You'll notice what I did was I put it in the side and I wedged it out. Instead of pulling away from it, which bends it, you don't wanna bend these outward when you're trying to yank it out. Pay close attention here. You see this? This backside is flush that was against the locomotive. This outside is not. There is a kick out here, okay? So what you wanna do is make sure that you've got the flush backside contacted against the frame when you reassemble it. The offset, the step out here on this right side, that would put these contacts 
a quarter of a millimeter away from the body, but you'd have more issues picking up from the electrical contact here. So you can take these off. You don't have to for a lube. I just wanted to see, show you how they uh, come and go in the frame. All right, so now make sure it's on the correct side. I'm putting them back in because we don't need to remove them for a basic lube job, all right? This isn't a service job. That may be another video. This one's a little tough to get it in, but you can see I, I worked it back in where it belongs. And the trucks, you look down, the little contact that comes up on the top of the truck tower is pressing against the copper strip. Same here on this end, so you're good. Now, when you take your Phillips and you go to disassemble this thing, one thing is gonna happen. Things are gonna fall out. So pay attention, all right, to uh, specifically the directionality of things. Some of these locomotives, I mean, it's kind of a universal thing. They'll go together the wrong way. Pay attention here, you got your magnet with the white stripe set to polarity. If you accidentally put this motor in upside down, it'll go back in, but the polarity of the magnet's important. So mentally note that. You'll see this, this motor here is a little bit loose in the frame. That's fine. That's perfectly normal. The saddle that clips this all together. You can see a little clip here and here. Those four little clips hold the motor where it needs to be. There's a little bit of play, but in the end, that causes less vibration and noise from the locomotive. So we're ready to take this thing apart. Don't pull your trucks out. People pull the trucks out to take it apart. You're wearing down the clips on the top of the trucks that retain them. That is the absolute wrong thing to do. You know, um, undo your shoelaces before you take your, your boots off. You know, ripping your foot out of there every time is nothing but discomfort. This is the same <laughs> theory. Loosen things up. They'll all come apart the way they're supposed to without doing any damage. So you unscrew these two screws. Now, you see that? Once the frame halves got loose, the trucks just pop out. I want you to look right here. You see these clips? When you yank out trucks, these clips wear down. This is Delrin. This is not replaceable. If you break these, see so your trucks are falling out from that little end of that little uh, nub right there. If you burnish that off from too many pullouts, you know, you're going to ruin your truck and you uh, will have to replace it. There's This is not something that you can fix with soldering or CA glue or anything like that. Because glue doesn't stick to this type of plastic. Right. Check your gears. These are bone dry. And I mean bone dry. Like these are... You know, it's ridiculous. This thing's never been lubricated. I can tell you it ran kind of smooth. Probably has a drop of lube from the factory, but we're going to come back and we're going to put a drop of lube on those later. First, we're going to get this chassis apart, all right? You guys are so lucky I had some coffee. Now, on the back side, you see the little donut here? The one fell out of this hole. It's just a little hex donut. It has a bevel. One edge has a flare, all right? The back edge. The front edge has a little bit of a, a round edge to it. Make sure you're putting it back in the right way when you stick it back in the frame half. And of course, your two screws are going to fall out of the frame. That's fine. Work on a table. It'll save you a lot of headache. What we're going to do is we're going to let that donut fall out. The other one might want to fall out, so let's just see if we can get that little buddy to pop out of there. Not with that, but if you just give it a little poke with a thin instrument right through the middle. All right, and we're going to take that out and show this thing fully disassembled. There we go. Just the tiniest little bit of prying. So... Again, motor polarity, white mark down, cool. It's only on one side, so just remember that. That's important. Then, we are going to pull these frame halves apart, but notice there's clips here and here, here and here on both sides. The motor saddle is clipped into both sides of the frame. Well, when you pull the frame apart, even just a little bit, these clips are going to want to start releasing, so pre-press the clips in just a little bit. Just a bit. All right, get something in there. Like, these are great. These little stainless, all right? You're pre-pressing these motor clips here to try and loosen them up just a little bit because we want the motor to stay in the other half without these copper contacts here. These are sprung contacts that hold the drive shaft against the other side, and again, prevent vibration. So take your implement and you give it just the lightest little twist. See? And you can see how it kind of clicked apart there. And those two were the first to pop out right here. And then we take the lower ones and we press those. And you can lift this frame half just a little bit. The top frame half, you press on that lower clip. You see that? It's loosening out from the chassis without doing a whole lot of prying of the chassis. All right, again, 
we're going for this little divot clip right here. I'm really trying to keep you guys in focus, but I think you're tracking. Now, hold your motor down, okay? And then we're gonna press a little more on that clip and try and get that buddy to loosen up and leave us where we wanna be with everything driveline-wise stuck in the one side that's on the table. This one's being a little stubborn, but that's okay. Stubborn things don't bother me because I am more tenacious than they are stubborn. Now, four clips released. Check this out. Hold your motor down. Lift this half of the frame up. See that? You just use your fingertip to hold that motor down. Now, in here, you see these contacts. They seem like they'd be electrical, but they're not. They're literally just little springs. One, two, three, four. And they press against the little bearing carriers here. It's extremely important that you pay attention to the way that things are installed. Now, I want to show you here these bearing carriers here, all right? I'm going to do just a little lift, and I'm going to take it off. I'm going to show you this piece right here. It's critical, critical, critical stuff. There we go. She's off. Now, this bearing carrier has, look at that, a flat side, okay? And it's got a side with some clipping in there, all right? A little bit of tooling. What this is, is this is a plastic carrier with, if you can see it, a little brass bearing inside. It's a swivel bearing, all right? But this is what we're here to do is lubricate that. This side, all right, with that little clip, there's one there, smooth face, there's one there. Those go up and down. You'll see a smooth face here, here, here. The little tangs in there, the retaining tangs, those got to face up and down when we go put her back together. In the drive line, you're going to see a few things. I'll point them out here, okay? These are the bearings in their carriers. That's what this is. Then you've got your washer right there, okay? Next to a worm gear with another washer, another bearing carrier. And then in there, between the flywheel, which is directly hard pressed onto the motor shaft, and this little drive shaft here, you see how loose that is? We're gonna take that out and I wanna show you what's in there. And it might take lifting the motor just a scat, just a little bit, there we go. Look at that, hex driver. Some motors will have a little two-pronged or three-pronged propeller shaft. Some motors will just have a little hex driver like this. That has to go in exactly how you found it. All right, so we're gonna take that out. The places we lubricate are where surfaces meet and one of those surfaces is moving. So the where this drive shaft rests in that bearing, you lube that. You lube the other side as well. It'll work its way out and lubricate these little washers on here. And I want to show you one right there. It's a little paper, little nylon washer. Those will get lubricated by default from what you put on the adjacent drive shaft. And it, they can be real tough to get out. There you go. See this? Look at that. That's what I'm talking about. These will pick up lube just from up on the drive shaft, and they're nylon, so that's great. They're almost self-lubricating. Mostly, you just want to make sure that you get two critical points. The bearings inside that hold these little shafts. It's less critical to get the little hex inlay here in the end of that uh, uh, flywheel. What is critical is that you get behind the flywheel. You see in there the drive shaft goes in. Well, where that drive shaft goes into the motor is another metal bearing. Should be, you know, brass. I cannot tell you the number of squealing Atlas and Cotto locomotives that have never been lubricated in that spot. This is an electrical motor, so you want to be careful to use very sparing lubricant. Never motor between that end and this end. You don't need to lube anything in there, okay? The only two things that are touching here are, well, there are four things, one on each end. A bearing holding the shaft here and there on each end, which you can see when we take this motor out, out of the saddle. And then the actual contacts that are underneath these little uh, tabs. In fact, while I'm talking, here's what we're going to do. I'm doing a full strip here. Pop this baby out. Now, because one side of the motor saddle is already out, she should come out pretty easily. All right, just a little bit of love to get this end of the motor out. See, now the motor saddle is out of the frame. Okay, oh, one little tang is hanging on. He's tanging on, we're gonna press that one out from the backside. 
Again, you don't want to wear out all the retaining clips, and those are part of it. All right? And look, you can't, there's no such thing as a perfect job. This is an older locomotive. We broke this tang, getting the motor saddle out, okay? That's one out of eight. Just be careful. This thing has a natural spring to it, and the pressure thereof, even of this little arm, will help retain the thing just fine. But I want you to know that these things are not um, heavy duty, okay? You gotta be careful, do it right. And even when you do it right, this is 10, 15, 20 year old brittle plastic. Sometimes things will break, you have to plan for that. Now, the motor side with the saddle here, see that rail, boom, boom, flip it over. It's not on this side. They have a C-clip, which you can see right there. Uh, let me get the tweezers here. This C-clip clips onto the motor. This is the motor saddle, it is removable. So if you pry it back gently by the main frame there, you can see it popping off. And if you, this is what you wanna do, hey, super cool, okay? This will get us to a point where we can access those little bearings. Now remember, this magnet side goes down, okay? And then these contacts here, top and bottom, they touch these tabs. So it's easy to say, well, wait, how did I put it back together? Well, we know mentally we marked the magnet goes down. And then these motor tangs touch the frame tangs here. And I want to show you adjacent because this is the sides there. Correct. This is one end, this is the other. Here and here, okay? And you can even see on this frame, there's a little bit of wear. Ooh, let me show you this, all right? See, there's a little bit of wear on the frame right there. That's where the motor has been moving around all of its life and rubbing away at this with that contact tab right there, the end of that thing. So, take this little plastic frame and gently, carefully pull it off don't let it pull apart your pull off your little tang here for the motor contact. Um, watch this a couple times. If it seems kind of daunting, just take your time, okay? Now, a baby drop, the tiniest drop. I want you to pay close attention. I take the tiniest little drop here. I'm trying to get this good on camera, all right? And I just, boop, I just put it right on that drive shaft. It's now in the bearing that's in this housing here. There's a little metal bearing in there, all right? Same thing here. You just take the tiniest little drop and you just barely dab it onto that drive shaft. Get a little extra, no problem, wipe it off. Now, this motor should run smooth as silk, okay? It feels real good and smooth. That's great. I can tell you this is not a new locomotive, which is why we're lubricating it. It's, uh, I bought it secondhand, but I know what it's capable of as far as running nice. So we're gonna do a couple other things here, okay? We're going to start putting her back together. I'm going to show you where else to lubricate. We're going to take this, we're going to clip this motor saddle back on. You see where the C-clips go here? Is on that little round plastic neck right there. And you just gently press, okay? Same thing on the other end, clip, and that pops right on. Okay, cool. Now, one of your copper tabs is tucked under there, no problem. Use gentle pair of tweezers, pull it out, bend it back over. Sweet. It's good to have a little spring to them like this. This is how they come. You can see that little uh, copper tab is kind of sprung, it's lifted like that. And it looks to me like somebody serviced this before. I don't see the broken tab, so it's probably not me who broke that one of the eight motor tabs. But hey, caution is, <laughs> it's a necessary skill in this hobby because everything's so small and breakable. Now, you see how I added some spring into that? Okay, cool. We're ready to go back together with the motor, okay? Face it the correct way. Remember, magnet side down, tangs toward this end of the frame. And we're gonna clip this baby back in, just the top clips, all right? We're gonna set that back there. We're gonna come over here and we're gonna take these little drive shafts with their bearings, and I'm gonna say one, one little tiny drop of oil. And I mean, baby, just a littlest drop of oil. And that's a little too much, honestly. So you just take off the excess, wipe it on your jeans, pretend it never happened, okay? Other side. I'm trying to watch the cameras, the real problem here. Other side, we're gonna do the same. Get just the tiniest little half drop of lube right there on that drive shaft behind the nylon washer. Now, I can see it. That should be not too much, just about right. And you take this drive shaft and you place it back in and you remember, again, turn this till the donut lines up. Remember that when we press it all back down, you want smooth faces here and here not the little 
tang sides like this, all right? Those are not your friend. Those need to go facing up and down. That's the way the, bo the motor bearing sits best in the uh, whole assembly. So, half a drop right behind that nylon washer, half a drop on this end, okay? And again, this oil is extremely viscous. Labelle, that's good stuff. And this has PTFE, which is the kind of the synthetic stuff that they used to use in VCRs and whatnot. It smells a little bit stronger than the regular Labelle. It will last for ages, and I mean ages and ages. So now, cut all apart, well, it's not that hard to put back together. I see that this other little tang here, this other little uh, contact strip, this fell out. So we'll put that back in when we're ready. Right now, get this drive shaft back in place. Of note, one here and one here, these are frame insulator donuts. They stay in there sometimes. This one's, you got to kind of work it. Okay, there it is. It's loose. This one was loose and happy to go party. If you lose these and you put your motor back together, you're in for a beautiful amount of sparks. You ever put a spoon in the microwave? These things will short out immediately and fry your power pack, fry your DCC system, fry, fry your motor, all kinds of stuff. You don't want that. So just be cautious when you're putting them back together that you've got the frame halves separated, okay? With this little ring and this little ring, and then, of course, that the motor contacts are laying where they should, and we're going to cover that. So now we've got this kind of in line. I'm going to press this one down so the flat side is up. I'm going to turn this one so the flat side is basically up. Same as already done on this side. And then you just take and you push these little motor clips in just a tad, just the tiniest bit. And it'll just want to fall into place. And while you're doing that, when you're about halfway, check your bearings. Your little bearing housing's there. Cool. And now, click, click. One spring contact here. I can see it making great contact with the frame right there. All right. I hope you guys can see that too. That's one of the motor contacts that I'm picking at, it's got springiness. Same with this one, the springiness, that's why there's a notch here in the frame. So this motor contact here, let me show you better on camera, this motor contact won't make contact with the frame, it'll only contact the other side of the frame half that insets in here, okay? And again, our magnet side was down, the white mark magnet, so this is all go back together correctly, it's fantastic. One of my donuts fell out, so I'm gonna put that back in. Now, all this black plastic is generally Delrin. It's like a nylon plastic. You cannot glue it. You cannot, you can hardly screw it. It's a problem. Um, so if you break something, see if you can make it work without trying to replace it and try and make it work without gluing it. Because half the time, that's futile. And the other half of the time, it'll seem like it works for a minute and then it'll just break. All right, now, the other frame half is ready to go on because all that's left, you can see all the parts here. We've got DC boards, all right? There's rear and front. We've got the screws and the little nuts, the little hex nuts that go on the back, all right? And then my little copper contact here. So this goes down straight, work on top or bottom first, all right? You get two of those little clips basically in, and then the other two will fall in place. And now, when you press that down, you'll see that the frame halves are sitting where they should. You can see your little insulator donuts there. And the only thing is this one, mm, got it. there it is. I had to press it down a little extra to get that last bottom clip to pop in. Again, gentle pressure. I'm talking like the amount of pressure you'd use put with a Q-tip in your ear. It's extremely light and gentle. And they say don't put Q-tips in your ear. Everybody does it, but you're not supposed to. And a lot of people don't ever read the packaging. I digress. I had a lot of hot tea, very caffeinated hot tea. Here we go, this copper strip. Look at the middle, see how it has that offset here, that step out, that little kick right there. You catch your finger on it. That faces outward. That puts the contact strip, all right, when you get that laid back in there, puts the back side of the contact strip against the side of the frame, and that's where you want it, so there's not a gap between the contact strip and the frame for the little motor contact tab on top of the truck to fall into, because they will fall into it. This right here, this is keeping this clear and clean as your best friend. Now, we've lubricated the points that saddle the entire drive line. You'll notice I didn't lubricate the little hex donut inside the flywheel. It's not really necessary. They fit pretty smugly. If you want to put a little bit in there, that's fine. I actually recommend a non-drying PTFE type grease if you're going to do that. I don't do it. 
the little bit of difference it'll make in noise is not worth the binding difference if you ever have like grease dry up, something like that. So now we're gonna do two drops of oil on the frame in a special place on the worm gears, one right on the face of each worm gear. The tiniest little drop here, come on, come on. Right there, that tiniest drop on the other. Because these are gears, they will generally just, the lube works its way around. And in here, you only need one drop not on the tower gear, this top spiky gear right here, the, the porcupine on top, not there. That's what contacts the worm gear that we already lubed. You want to go down and you want to lubricate the one gear, just one drop, in one of these gears in the truck. Just the tiniest drop, boom, there. If you have dust on your layout, the lubricant will collect it. After a while, if you use a cheap lubricant, especially non-PTFE, just like an old bottle that you had laying around from 20 years ago. It'll harden up and all that dust will turn to cement and slow you down, bog you down, or it'll cake up in an area where you'll get a limp in your locomotive and you don't want that. So, now, I have not put the screws back in because the frame is loose and we can gently and very easily press these trucks back in. See, just like that. Like, just, uh, uh, just like you'd pet a bunny on top of his head, the gentlest little push. Okay, very nice. And now, pinch your frame. That'll hold the trucks in. Put one donut back in. And again, it's got a bevel. You see that? You see that little lip? The lip on that backside there. God, I wish you could see it better. All right, I think you can see it. That little flare, that flashing, that's the outside. Press it back in. All right, keep holding your frame together or this will happen. It'll pop right back out on you. <laughs> Let's put that back in and gently hold the frame together. And it's it's not easy to do this with two hands while you're trying to film. It's easier to do it if you're focusing on it. So watch the video and then go and do it. How's that for a deal? Okay. Finger tight. The frame will seat. It'll seat on the donut. Don't wrench it down. You will either strip the hex screw or you'll be crushing the little nylon space room between the frame halves. You don't want either of those, okay? Same thing on this end. Your truck is seated in place. Put your little nylon donut in, and this one's got a heck of a flashing on one side of it. I don't know if you can see that, but yeah. That's the outset. Right there. And the reason you're doing that is because these things are screwed in. You want the screw to go in and rehome where it came from. In the same threads, all right? You can strip those out easier than you think, especially because tools allow for an amount of torque to be applied that is unreasonable for a small toy like this. Now, we are back together mechanically. So, make sure your truck swivel. Great. Almost. Check this out. I've got an overhang. You see this? So, just right here, lift that. Click. It rests on top. On this side, because of my bumbling fingers, they had gotten inset, but look at that. They should spring just like that and right on top of that little contact that's on top of the truck there and you can see it, okay? See a little copper contact right there. Now this is a 101 course. A lot of you guys already know this, but honestly, man, I mean, I love this, I love sharing knowledge and there are a lot of people that would have no idea where to go about this and they pay people to do it for them. See the little R and, uh, and so, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what I'm here for. I'm here to show you guys how to do it yourself. So, I know that the tanks on this locomotive can pop right back on. Boom. There you go. R is for reverse. We'll put that in the rear. And you just work it in a little bit, and you'll see where it starts to make contact. But you're going to have to wiggle it side to side to seat it. You see that, how it's now flush along the front edge? And you'll feel that thing seating. You will absolutely feel when it's clicking in. It's a little bit of pressure, but these frames are designed to work with this thickness board to click in there. If you try and use a different board in certain locomotives, you could crack the frame retainer here. This is a little tab, and this is cast pot metal, so its breakability factor is high. So if you're not using the stock headlight board and you're changing that, measure it. If you try and stuff a, a thicker one into these, you can break it, period. The only way to avoid that is to go in with a micro file and take off some material here and here. And I want to show you what I'm talking about. 
You see this groove? The boards are designed to bend. This is a dip, and then there's a little knuckle right inside there on the bottom edge of this that gives that downward pressure. But that's why they make such good contact. They're reliable. So you take this and you just wiggle it in. All right, everything good? Where are we at? 30 minutes. This was not a short video, but I appreciate you guys and your patience. On a Jeep, the air tanks go toward the rear. So you take this bubby and you just place the shell back on. Let me show you from the side. You guys can't see that. All right. The air tanks go to the rear. You take the shell, no obstructions, and you can check your headlight jewels there. The little uh, headlight reflectors, they're uh, like light diffusion elements there, in the front and rear. Make sure that one of them didn't slide in a little bit, because if it pops in, you might not catch it, but if it's in more than about a mm, half a mil millimeter, it'll catch when you go to put the shell back on, and that'll just cause you all kinds of problems. So, from the side, right here, you got your shell, your coupling, everything. Hold this gently by the fuel tank, all right? And just put one end on, front or rear, doesn't matter, just uh, about a third of the way. And look right here, see that dimple? Right there, and right there. These dimples align with divots inside the shell to retain the shell when you pop it back on. So you just put one on about halfway, and then the other, and click it down, boom, boom. There you go. You now have a lubed and serviced GP7. Let's take it over the track and see if it's as quiet as I hope. And if it's not, then um, you won't ever see this video. And I'll just go drink my sorrows away with a cup of apple juice. <laughs> distilled apple juice. Okay, here we are again on the Green Foam Express. I wanted to show you something real quick. This is an older Atlas locomotive. Now, the way you could tell inside was because it had split DC boards, one on each end. The newer ones will come in a box that says Atlas Classic or Atlas Master, and then gold and silver line are the new Atlas declarations of quality slash, if it says gold, I think those are the ones that come with DCC from factory. If you see one of these old blue and red boxes, that thing sure is patriotic, but it's also an indicator that you will have a harder time putting digital in this locomotive. This is the correct box for this engine. The thing looks like almost new, but I will tell you, the older motors and the older mechanisms are just not as quiet as the newer ones. Still, let's see how she runs. With our expectations tempered, not bad, not too noisy. She's got a bit of a growl, but I can tell you, I recognize that sound. That's gears. They need to be lapped. They need to be worn in. So basically, we're just going to put this thing on half speed or so and let it do laps for an hour in each direction, and that'll quiet her down a bit, okay? But I will tell you this. With all that lubrication in the right place, they will creep. And when I say creep, I mean like... Remember that TLC song? So if you get a good controller... You can do yard work with these. I have a Rail Power 1370. She's got a little bit of lurch at low speeds, but that is slow. That's a real good creep. Not that being a creep is a good thing, but doing a creep is a good thing if you're a locomotive. Last I checked, I'm neither a creep nor a locomotive, but I am a very proud owner of a beautifully running Atlas GP7 with a DC and in one of the most beautiful paint schemes ever to grace the rails. So, like, comment, subscribe. I appreciate you all. If you learned something great, if not, better luck next time. <laughs> See you in the next one.